Well, tonight I want to speak on the subject of Israel, God's anvil, and the three horrific wars that are in Israel's future. And someone, someone said that the purpose of prophecy is not to predict the future, but the purpose of prophecy is bringing glory to God whenever it's fulfilled. That's right. That's right. Amen, brother. And uh, right. prophecy is being fulfilled in the time that we're living, and much more is going to be fulfilled in the future. About one, or about 25 percent of the Bible is prophecy. About one every, out of every 27 verses in the Bible concern some kind of a prophecy. And so one cannot preach the Bible or study the Bible without, without uh, uh, speaking or studying uh, prophecy. Otherwise, they're not, as uh, someone said, they're not preaching the whole English Bible. Only about 75% of the Bible. And so <clears throat> we're going to look at these uh, uh, three wars tonight concerning Israel. Amen. Prophecy sometimes shadow. I, we have to give each other quite a quite a latitude here because sometimes uh, things are just not very clear right. in Scripture, and so we have to really uh, really be careful here about uh, about going uh, being too dogmatic on some things because it just doesn't. Uh, it's not that clear in Scripture. And so it's kind of like looking through a glass. There is some sort of distortion there whenever you're looking through a glass. And so uh, let's turn uh, over to Zechariah 12, verses 2 and 3. It's a text tonight. Zechariah 12, verse 2 and 3. The Bible says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Not long, I was at, not long ago, I was at a car dealership, and uh, in the waiting room they had a big black an uh, anvil sitting on a table with an inscription down below telling the story about this big old black an uh, anvil. Come to find out that dealership had burned to the ground in 1946. The office buildings and the garage and uh, all the surrounding buildings were burned to the ground, just ashes. Everything was destroyed. Everything in that dealership was absolutely destroyed except that anvil. That anvil survived, and uh, it made me think as I was preparing this message, my, uh, all the nations that come against Israel is going to be destroyed, but Israel's going to survive. Israel's not going to be destroyed. And so, uh, <clears throat> there's a, uh, there is abundance of Scripture. You might want to pull out a pen and some paper. We're going to go through lots of Scriptures tonight concerning these three wars, because there is an abundance of Scripture concerning these three horrific wars that Israel is going to be involved in. And uh, the first war and the next war that is going to be a major war is uh, that concerns Israel. Uh, we call the Psalm 83 and Obadiah War. All of Psalm 83 concerns this war. All of Obadiah concerns this coming war. And we're going to spend some time on that war because uh, it's very possible you and I will be around to see that war. Now the rapture could happen at any time, but uh, if the Lord delays uh, the rapture, well, we're, we're definitely going to see this war because... Uh, it's just over the horizon. It's in the near future, and we can see, we can see the shadow of it even now. We can see things happening in the Middle East even now. This building towards this 
this huge confrontation here on the horizon between the holy God of the Bible and Islam. And the heart of the confrontation is who's going to control Jerusalem. In all three of these wars that we're going to look at tonight, Jerusalem is the objective of those invading armies. It's Jerusalem that they want. Jerusalem is at the center of the earth. Jerusalem is the navel of the earth. Geographically, Jerusalem is at the epicenter of, this, of the earth. And all nations in the Bible are, are geographically located in relationship to where Jerusalem is and where, how far away or which direction they are in from Jerusalem. The Bible is all about Israel. And uh, Israel produces Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus himself was a Jew. It's not about the East. It's not about the West. It's about the Middle East. And Israel in particular. And the only nations otherwise that are mentioned in the Bible is what they have to do with Israel. And so God is using... Uh, Israel as an anvil against Islam. When the Islamic nations come against Israel and Jerusalem, God will judge them and this destruction will lead them to realize that the Bible is the Word of God. Now let's turn over to Psalm 83, if you will, and uh, begin reading in verse 2. For lo, thy enemies make atonement, and they that hate thee have lifted up thy head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one cons consent. They are confederate against thee. And then the Bible goes on to name these ancient people's names who are involved in this invasion. The very first one that it mentions is the Tabernacles of Edom. Edom is uh, the, uh, the modern day Palestinian people are the Edomites. Edom. They come from Edom and from Esau. That's right. They uh, then they goes on to uh, name other nations, and whenever we break these nations down into modern nations, they would be five nations that surround Israel the closest. That would be Syria. These people now live in Syria. They live in Lebanon. They live in Jordan. They live in Saudi Arabia, and they live in Egypt. Those five nations. Those five nations, which are closest to Israel, are referred to as the inner circle. The inner circle of nations that are closest to Israel. There's an inner circle and there's an outer circle, which we'll get to later on. But this inner circle of nations are going to going to confederate themselves. They're going to be allies. They're going to be a union. Uh, they're going to uh, join together and uh, they're going to come against uh, Israel for the purpose of wiping Israel out and uh, destroying Israel uh, forever. The Bible says, it goes on to say uh, that, uh, uh, who said, in verse 12, said, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession? Oh my God, make them like a wheel as a stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, so persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame. Now why? That they may seek thy name, O Lord. That's the purpose of the war. That's the purpose of the war. And the result of the war is that they would seek God's name. They would seek, the, not Allah, but they would seek the real God, the God of the Bible. Amen. 
Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. That's the result of the Psalm 83 war. Uh, after the Psalm 83 Obadiah war, uh, the, 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 the battle cry of uh, uh, Allah Akbar is not going to be heard very much in the world. The homeland of Islam is going to be destroyed. It's not going to be eliminated by coexistence and all these bumper stickers around the country with, with all the symbols of all the religions of the world uh, sitting around a campfire and singing Kumbaya. That's not going to be how it ends. I'll tell you how it's going to end. It's going to end in war. There's this, this Psalm 83 and, uh, and uh, Obadiah war is going to end the war on terrorism. That's how the world terrorism is going to end. It's going to end in a gigantic conflict which is coming. Some refer to this as World War III. I, I, I'm more and more leaned towards that direction myself. The Bible describes here a regional war, but again, the Bible does not describe any nation that does not have a direct effect on Israel. It doesn't say anything at all about South America. It doesn't say anything at all about Japan, as far as I know, or North Korea or uh, Australia. Only those countries that are directly affected by uh, Israel and to Israel, or, or does the Bible mention. So it might be that uh, uh, America will have an enemy uh, that uh, attacks her as well. Maybe Russia will attack us. Maybe North Korea will attack us. Maybe China will attack us. Maybe we'll, we, will not be, we will not be able to help or perhaps we won't even desire to help Israel. Israel's on their own here in these, all three of these wars. It's only Israel and God. Israel has no allies. It's only Israel and God. Could be during this period of time, during this war, that China would attack Taiwan and take Taiwan. It could be that North Korea would attack South Korea. Uh, this is uh, very possible because uh, uh, Daniel says that the Antichrist is going to come in time of a war. He's going to be bringing peace. If the, if the Antichrist comes bringing peace, it just stands to reason that he would be coming in time of war because what reason would he come bringing peace if there's already peace? Right. So Antichrist comes according to many and, I, and I'm in, in that camp that believes that this next world war will bring, uh, as a result, will bring Antichrist. He'll come in to pick up the pieces. It's going to be a humongous war, uh, far greater than World War II, and it's hard to imagine a war greater than World War II. Right. It's hard to imagine the ferocity of a war that is even more destructive in human life and property than World War II. Fifty-five million people dead in World War II. This war is going to be greater than that. Simply because of the weapons that are going to be used, chemical, biological, nuclear, and electromagnetic and scalar weapons. The technology since World War II is so much greater today. It just, it, it, it's almost uh, mind-boggling how fast people, whole peoples are going to disappear here in this war. Uh, whole, whole nations are going to disappear. And so let's go over to o, the little book of Obadiah now. All of Obadiah deals with the Psalm 83 Obadiah War. Let's begin reading in verse 15. And this gives us the timing of the war. For the day of the Lord is near. So then we, that uh, uh, is interesting because we, have, we must find out, we must, we must understand when the day, what the day of the Lord is. And as far as I know, the day of the Lord is a time when God works independently of man. He works directly in the affairs of man. 
But that's not, that's not here yet. Some say that it, that begins with the tribulation. Some say that begins with halfway through the tribulation. But whatever time that is, it's not at the time of this war. The day of the Lord is near. It's close. It's close, but it's not here yet. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as she have drunk upon my holy mountain, the holy mountain is Israel. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. The heathen is Islamic peoples, nations that come against Israel. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they have not been. The destruction of the Islamic nations, there's five Islamic nations that come against Israel will be so complete that it will be as they have not been. Or, I'm sorry, uh, the Palestinian people is talking about the Palestinian people here in Obadiah, not the five nations, but the, the Palestinians. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. So who is the house of Esau? The modern day Palestinian people. The Edomites. And the Bible says they're going to be wiped out. There's not going to be any remain. The, the, the lineage of Esau is going to end in Obadiah. At the Obadiah war. Psalm 83 war. The line of Esau which stretches all the way back into ancient uh, biblical times is going to suddenly come to an end. There's not going to be any remaining. Then it goes on to say in verses 19, 20, 21 that as a result of this war, uh, Israel's borders are going to be greatly expanded. Amen. And so Israel, the little country of Israel, is going to be greatly expanded as a result of World War III. It's going to become one of the largest nations in the Middle East and it's going to become one of the wealthiest and most powerful nations in the Middle East. It's going to possess all the possessions, including the oil wells of Saudi Arabia. And its borders are going to stretch. Uh, Genesis and chapter 15 and verse 18 says, from the Euphrates River to the Nile River in Egypt. All that's going to be Israel. The little country of Israel is going to expand 125 times bigger than what they are right now. And so since 1981, our leaders, every president, every administration since 1991 has been pressuring Israel to, to give up land for peace. That's just exactly opposite from what God wants them to do. And I have this to say to all politicians of all stripes and of all parties, get out of Israel's business. Amen. Just stay out of it. Let God handle that. You're bringing judgment down upon all of us. Because Joel in chapter 3 and verse 2 says that God does not want the land parted. He does not want the land parted. And so, Psalm 83, Obadiah, war takes place. Israel's greatly expanded up to the, from the Nile to the Euphrates River. And these countries are laying ruins. And the population, no doubt, at that time will greatly increase. There's more Jews in New York City than there is in Israel right now. There are six million Jews in Israel. There's two million Arabs living in Israel. And uh, there's more Jews in 
New York City, but New York City is getting ready to be a ghost town. When this war takes place, and when these people are destroyed, and the Israeli army uh, occupies all this land area, possessions, the Jews from all over the world are going to return to Israel. They're going to flood the country. Israel is going to be wealthy beyond their imagination and powerful beyond their imagination, even though they've been badly, uh, badly uh, 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 hurt here in this war because the Bible says uh, in, in verse uh, 18 uh, that uh, they're going to be, uh, the, the, the house of, or no, verse uh, 17, that, uh, that the house of Jacob is also going to uh, receive some uh, damage. Israel itself is going to receive some damage. And so no doubt Israel will be damaged, but Israel is going to emerge from that war uh, victorious. And uh, <clears throat> result of all that is Isaiah, or, or rather Psalms 83 and verse 18, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. Now, <clears throat> From 70 A.D., when Titus, the Roman general, destroyed Jerusalem and he killed a million Jews and he sold the rest of them into slavery. And here, let me take this thing here off. And uh, sold the rest of them into slavery, spread the Jews all over the world, to the four corners of the earth, that began God's judgment on the Jew because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. Well, God responded to that in 70 AD. He judged, he judged the Jew. The Jew was scattered to the four points of the earth. They did not have a homeland. Uh, they were not called God, his people anymore uh, during this period of time. They were not called his people. And that lasted up and through the Holocaust. Whenever Hitler destroyed six million Jews in Germany and Europe in World War II. And had not God raised up the Allies to defeat Hitler, Hitler would have killed every Jew living. Yes. But you see, that wasn't God's will. Right. God has a plan and a purpose for the Jew. Right. And so God raised up the Allied armies to defeat the German army and Hitler and uh, to uh, save a remnant because God had a purpose for them. In chapter 37, which describes the Holocaust, of it, th chapter 37 of Ezekiel, which describes the Holocaust, and Israel in grave-like conditions. Chapter 37 and verse 10 says that God's going to raise up an exceeding great army. That's when they were being persecuted by Hitler. It didn't look much like an exceeding great army at that time. And remember that the Jew was still in unbelief. The Jew was still in unbelief. And uh, uh, he's in unbelief today. And uh, But God said he's going to raise up an exceeding great army. And so the World War II is over in 1945. Israel became a nation May the 14th, 1948, shortly after World War II. And uh, those survivors of the Holocaust made up the bulk of that army, that ragtag army of Israel in 1948, which beat five Arab nations that came against them with bolt-action rifles and hand grenades. That's about all they had. 
yet they won against these five armies. They, they were a nation that was born in a day. And they were a nation that was born just opposite from what most nations are. Most nations go through a revolution, and at the end of the revolution, then they have a, they're born as a nation, just as ours was at the end of the American Revolution. Now, they were born on the morning of May the 14th, 1948. By nightfall of that same day, five Arab nations, armies, attacked them. And they found themselves in a in the revolution. They found themselves in a, in a battle. They, was, they were, had already become a nation. And because they became a nation, then the Arabs attacked them, tried to drive them into the sea. They won in 1948. Again, this happened in 1956. And uh, uh, again, this happened in 1967. And again, the Arab nations came against them in 1973. And all of these four wars, uh, they... they uh, we're victorious in these wars. So the Arabs says, hey, we're not doing something right here. What we need to do is regroup here and have a different plan. So then they started the terrorist war. And that's what we're in today. Right. And World War III here, or the, the Psalm 83 and Obadiah War will end the terrorist war. And so this exceeding great army, which had its seed in the Holocaust, that God says, I'm going to raise up a, uh, an exceeding great army. Since that time, today, Israel is one of the best armies in the world. Not the greatest, not the biggest, not the best perhaps, but it is among the best armies in the world. And uh, God is going to use the... Israeli defense forces to defeat these five nations that come against it. That's the purpose of raising up the uh, IDF. That's the purpose of raising up the uh, uh, Israeli army so they can defeat these five nations coming against Israel in this gigantic war that's over the, over the horizon. During this time, during this period of time, most believe that Damascus will be destroyed according to Isaiah 17 and verse 1. Isaiah 17 and verse 1 says that Damascus will be a ruinous heap. Now Damascus, Syria is the headquarters of the Hezbollah. It's the headquarters of Hamas. And it's the headquarters of every known terrorist organization in the Middle East. And so the Bible says it's going to be wiped out. Most likely during this, this gigantic war here of Psalm 83 and uh, verse, uh, and uh, uh, Obadiah. And so, <clears throat> now why is God doing this? Why is, why is God doing this? Here's the people of Israel which basically are, are in unbelief. Uh, hey, hey, a, a lot of them are Kabbalistic Jews, which is occultic Jews. That, that is part of the Jewish religion that they brought out of Babylon. It's, uh, it's uh, Kabbalism. I saw a sign on I-95 down there close to Miami. It had a big billboard. Come and join the, the Kabbalistic uh, synagogue. They're recruiting members for Kabbalism is what they're doing. And so uh, some of them are just uh, secular atheists. Some of, them are, some of them are Orthodox. They limit the number of Orthodox Jews in Israel because they don't want the number of the, the Orthodox Jews to have any kind of political power. They, they keep their number down there very low. But they want the secular Jews to, to uh, have the power in Israel. And so God is not doing that for the Jew. God is doing that for His holy name. He's doing that for His own name. He's not doing it for them. Right. They're bringing shame to His name. Right. Spiritually speaking. Uh, look, over, look over at uh, uh, Ezekiel. 37 and verse 8. 
Let me see if I can find Ezekiel real quick here. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 and verse 8. Now, this, this tells us the condition of Israel. This tells us the unbelief that they have. Ezekiel 37 verse 8. The Bible says, And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. There was no spiritual life in them. They were dead spiritually. They're still dead spiritually. They had flesh. They had bones. They had skin. But they had no, they had no breath. And uh, so now let's go over to... Uh, 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 Zephaniah, the little book of Zephaniah in chapter 2. All of Je uh, Zephaniah chapter 2 concerns the Psalm 83 and the Obadiah war that is coming. It begins in verse 1 by saying, Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. That was 1948. That verse, that verse of prophecy was fulfilled on May 14, 1948. They gathered themselves together as a nation, but they're a nation undesired. They're an unbelief. If they were a nation that were desired, uh, or a nation in belief, the Bible would say, "Oh, nation desired." But it says not desired, that they're in unbelief. They rejected God, the God of the Bible. So he doesn't do that for them sake, their sake. He does it for his own sake, for his own holy name. That's right. And so, <clears throat> over in verse 10, this shall they have for their pride. And it's talking about the Islamic religion. This they have for their pride. Remember, whenever 9/11 took place, and remember all those uh, all those uh, Arabs out in the streets, and they were shooting guns up in the air, celebrating because we had an attack and 3,000 Americans died. They're they're lifted up with pride, you see. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of Hosts, is and that speaks of Islam. The Lord will be terrible unto them. Verse 11 says, For He will famish all the gods of the earth. That's the end of Islam. The word famish means to emaciate, to be made thin. He's going to thin them out all right by the millions. By the millions. For he will famish all the gods of the earth. I wish these people would get saved. Amen. I wish uh, all these is, uh, Islamic people would trust Christ as their Savior and be saved, but that's not what the Bible says is going to happen. What the Bible says is going to happen is through war, God is going to destroy the Islamic religion as a, as a, as a people and as a religion. And as a result, the survivors are going to be shown that Allah is not the true God, but the Jehovah God of the Bible is the true God. In ancient times, armies that went to war against one another, uh, the loser would always, the winner would always say to the loser, your God wasn't powerful enough for you to win. Allah is not more powerful than Jehovah. Islam's not going to win this battle. Islam's going to be destroyed. It's going to be wiped out. All the gods of the earth and men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. Because when it say in verse 12, ye Ethiopians also ye shall be slain by my sword. So evidently 
the fight's going to go on down into Ethiopia as well. The battle's going to go on down into there as well. But all of this chapter deals with the uh, condition of the people before the battle and during the battle and uh, of Psalm 83 and, uh, and uh, Obadiah. And so... <clears throat> And so, um, this, thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, Ezekiel 38 and verse 16. And so 2,600 years ago, Ezekiel speaks to us about a great war taking place on the mountains of northern Israel. Often this battle is referred to as the battle of Gog and Magog. Ezekiel lists the, the nations to come against Israel as Turkey, Iran, Libya, Ethiopia, parts of Eastern Europe, and Russia. Russia and Iran lead this great army coming from the north to invade Israel. No battle, no war in all of the Bible is more detailed than this war right here, the second war. Although there's a lot of scripture for Psalm 83 that we didn't have time to cover here. Jeremiah mentioned some, some of it, and so does Isaiah, and then uh, the minor prophets as well. But Ezekiel 38 and 39 goes into great detail about this great battle coming, this, this confederacy called the Outer Circle, or Islamic nations that are further away from Israel. That's the Outer Circle. Geographically, they're further away. And parts of Russia are Muslim too, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so Turkey's Muslim, and Iran is Muslim, and Libya is Muslim. So there are predominantly Muslim countries that are coming down. It's, some, say, some say possibly Germany uh, with a, uh, will come against uh, uh, Israel at this time. And the Bible mentions many other people. Many other people. Uh, I forget, I think it says many bands with thee. Remember, as we look over here to, to Ezekiel, let me let me go over here for the uh, to get over here in Ezekiel. And uh, many many bands with these. So it indicates that not only will these nations come, but perhaps all the Islamic nations in the world. I think there's 54 nations in the world that are Islamic. Out of 195 nations, 54 of them are Islamic. And so, perhaps all the nations that are left that are Islamic will come against uh, Israel. And it might be that, uh, that uh, Russia and Iran uh, see uh, this great war take a place, uh, takes place in World War III, and they see the uh, destruction of uh, uh, these, uh, their fellow Islamic countries, and they say, hey, you didn't do it right. We can do it right. We're going to come down there and we're going to wipe Israel out. And not only that, we're going to take all the spoil that they've gained. We're going to take Saudi Arabia. We're going to take his oil fields. We're going to take all the possessions that the Palestinian people have. We're going to take all the possessions of, that uh, Egypt has. We're going to take everything. Everything that you gained, we're going to take. And so this army... This army that comes against Israel is far greater than the, the previous army. Each one of these wars will be progressively bigger and more destructive. More people, uh, uh, more nations involved and more armies involved and the, the, the destruction will be, will be greater. And so... There's lots of talk about Iran today in the news, they, they just keep things stirred up all the time. Right. I'm not fearful of <coughs> the war starting with Iran because the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the next great war is going to be those five nations right next to Israel. Right. Iran's going to sit on the sidelines. God's reserving them for this war right here, uh, the Magog War. They're going to be allies. They are allies with Russia right now. Uh, old Putin said the other day, he says, we are Iran's protector. Russia says, we are Iran's protector. Uh, 
So there's lots of talk about war. Uh, Jesus said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars in the in the last days, in the end times. And so <clears throat> if it's not wars that are real wars, then they're talking about war. They're threatening war. And I'll tell you what Iran does. Every time the price of oil gets down low, then they threaten a war, and the price goes back up. Now, they're not really dummies when it comes to making money. They got oil. They want, they had rather sell oil at a higher price than a low price. Because all they got to do is rattle, rattle the, 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 the missiles and their, their guns and their bombs and, and say, we're going to come after you and we're going to destroy Israel or we're going to destroy America. We're going we're gonna to do this. We're going to do that. That's a rumor of war. Right. Jesus said our times will be characterized by wars and rumors of wars. We've already had the two most destructive wars in the world's history, World War I and World War II. We're getting ready for the most destructive in the world's history so far, and that would be World War III. And uh, there's not been a year since 1945, there's not been a year in the world that there has not been an average of 40 wars since 1945 somewhere in the world. So we're living in a time of war and rumors of wars. Just as Jesus said, that would precede His coming and that would characterize His coming as He said in Matthew chapter 24. Now, and by the way, if you just turn right over here to uh, chapter 36, the next page over here, verse 21, but I had pity for my holy name. Why does God do this for Israel? Why does He save Israel? Uh, are they worth saving, we might ask sometimes? They've not done anything for God. They have cursed His name. They have spit upon His, his provision for them. They have rejected His only begotten Son. Why should God do anything for them, we might ask? Well, He's not doing it for them. He's doing it for Himself. He's got a reputation to uphold. He's made promises. And although man might go back on his promises, and often does, God's never going to go back on his promises. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned. Does that sound like this crowd today? Among the heathen, whither they went, wherever they were in the world. Uh, wherever these Jews were in the world since 70 A.D., uh, nobody was impressed with a Jew. Nobody wanted to become a Jew. In fact, every ill thing that came along was blamed upon the Jew. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. Yes. It goes on to say, uh, thus saith the, in verse 33, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I have cleansed you from all your iniquities, that's, that's 1948, when they became a nation, the judgment on the Jew was, was, was over with then. The judgment ended on the Jew in 1948. For almost 1900 years, God's judgment was on these people. They, they suffered... They suffered so much as unimaginable for rejecting Jesus Christ as, their, uh, uh, as, a, as a Messiah. It's unimaginable. They had no homeland. They were bounced and torn from a country after country. They were rejected. They, the, they, were, they were spit upon. They were, they were uh, killed and, and uh, uh, all sorts of things. And then the Holocaust. But the Holocaust ended their judgment. It ended their judgment. And so here, uh, verse 33 picks that up and it says, Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I have cleansed you from all your iniquities. That's, that, that is 1948. They, uh, God, God does not hold them responsible for that anymore. He has disciplined them for that. You don't keep on spanking your kids over and over. I mean, there comes a time whenever the spanking ends. The discipline has been administered. 
and it's over. We go into something else. That's 1948. I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the waste shall be builded, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. That's a picture of Israel right there. Uh, uh, Israel blossomed as a rose since the Jew came in. And you go over to the Middle East. If you've been over to the Middle East, my friend, you'll see uh, Israel is a prosperous land. Israel's modern. Israel, Israel has technology. Israel has uh, uh, green forest. Israel has uh, uh, riches. Israel has grass. Then go over to Syria. It's the bad side of the neighborhood, friend. All these Arab countries are the bad side of the neighborhood. Uh, when we were, at, when, when Brother Harden and I and Joy and, and Cheryl went to the Holy Land back in 1973, we were in D Damascus, Syria, and we were going to the street called Straight about midnight, and uh, uh, we had a, uh, we, we uh, were on uh, a ship uh, anchored out, uh, uh, docked over there in uh, 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 Lebanon, I think it was, Beirut. And out of the darkness came an Arab man with a three-year-old boy. And he says, I will sell you this boy for $3. They have no value on human life, whatever. We had to kick the garbage literally out of our way to walk down that street. It's filthy. The streets are stinking and they're filthy. So when the Jew came back in 1948, that land was absolutely desolated. The, the Romans had cut down all the trees. It was nothing but basically desert. And so every, every, time, every year since 1948, the school kids go out and they plant a tree in Israel. They plant a tree. It will blossom as the rose. Yes. That's what the Bible says. And that's what's happening in Israel. And so this war, chapter 38, chapter 38, and uh, describes exactly the nations coming against uh, Israel. In the verse 4 it says, And I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thine army, the horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now, that describes battle in, in Ezekiel's time. Well, in modern times, that would be helicopters, that would be paratroopers, that would be tanks, that would be uh, modern implements of war, mechanized uh, infantry. All sorts of armor, even a great company of bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords, Persia, which is Iran. Ethiopia and Libya, which has retained their ancient names, with them all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togomah of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee, many people with thee. So a great army, it's like a cloud coming, the Bible says in, in Ezekiel 30, like a cloud coming to cover the land. His Israeli army is far outmatched. It's no match for this army. It, could, it defeated those five armies surrounding Israel, but not. Russia is the only country on the earth. James Baker, Secretary of State, said in the 1980s under Reagan, he said Russia is the only nation on the earth that can destroy America in 30 minutes. You're talking about, they don't have much of an economy, but buddy, they, they've they got a nuclear arsenal. And they've got scalar weapons. And they're coming against Israel and, Ma and Magog, the Magog War. And God does not use the Israeli army anymore. They've served their purpose. They defeated the inner circle. But now God 
destroys the outer circle personally. Now we're in the day of the Lord. God intervenes in human affairs and He inter intervenes in a personal way. He turns them against themselves. The Bible says brother against brother. He turns them against themselves and they start killing themselves. He sends great hail fire, uh, hail, hail stones with fire and brimstone according to uh, the 39th chapter of uh, uh, Ezekiel. In 38th chapter. In chapter 38, he says, uh, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains in verse 21. And uh, saith the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. Thus, here's the result of this war. What's all this for? Well, look at verse 23. That's what it's all for. Thus will I magnify myself Amen. and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know I am the Lord. And I'm telling you what, every person on this earth is going to look at that war over there, and they're going to say, my, oh, my, what a humongous battle that was, and how Israel didn't even fire a shot. And look at all the dead soldiers. It's going to take... It's going to take uh, uh, Seven months to bury all those dead soldiers, the Bible says. They're going to say, the God of the Bible, the world is going to say that only the God of the Bible could have done this. So therefore, God's going to magnify His name as a result of this war. Well, let's go on. There's one more war. There's one more war, and that is Armageddon, war number three. He gathered them together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. <laughs> Revelation 16 and verse 16. Now, there's one, one word that the American public knows. They might not know any other thing about the Bible, but I guarantee you they know this word. Uh, <clears throat> Whenever there is any kind of conflict over in the Middle East, usually I've noticed about a 10% increase in the uh, church attendance overall. Overall, about 10% increase in all the churches in the country. Uh, temporarily. And people are going to be fearful. When there's, a, when there's a war over in the Middle East, they become fearful. And uh, I've had some of them come up to me and ask me personally this. Uh, is this Armageddon? Is this Armageddon? So a few days passes and the conflict, or a few weeks can pass, and the conflict is over with and uh, finished, and then they go back to their bingo game. <laughs> See? False alarm. I don't really have to get right with God after all. I, uh, you know, I can go back to what, living like I was living. I was afraid for a while, but man, that sure was a scare, but... Now it's over with. Now Armageddon. Armageddon means Mount Megiddo, which is about 70 miles north of Jerusalem. Uh, Israel is a country with plains on both sides. And there is a, a long chain of mountains are about 100 miles long. And it's like a spine on a, on a, in a person's body. It runs uh, right from north down to the south. And uh, about 70 miles from the northern be beginning of that chain of mountains, mountain range, sits the city of Jerusalem. It's right in the, it, it's high up in those mountains actually. Uh, you start climbing up there, uh, you don't really notice you're climbing, uh, but you really are climbing on up to the city of Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem, by the way. You never go down. And then, and then that uh, chain of mountains extends on about 30 miles south of the city of Jerusalem. Up, on, up in that northern, up in that northern uh, valley, the valley that is in northern Israel, is the plain of Jezreel. The plain of Jezreel is 25 miles long, about 14 miles wide. It runs uh, north, west, and south 
uh, east, kind of catty quartered. And it is one of the most used battlefields in, on the, in the world's history. So many great battles have been decided here. 1,500 years before Jesus came, there was battles on that plain. Napoleon sat on his horse on Mount Megiddo overlooking this great valley. And he says, this is the greatest battlefield in the world. He said all of the world's armies could maneuver them in this valley. No doubt he had an eye looking toward Armageddon. And uh, he knew the significance of that. Uh, Cheryl and I have also been there. Nobody, the pastor's been there. Looked out across that valley and it's an impressive sight. Uh, this tremendously long valley. You can just imagine these armies had gathered there in such great numbers. And then across across the valley you could see another mountain range. So it kind of sits in a bowl there somewhat. 200 million soldiers, the Bible says, are going to come against Israel. Led by Antichrist. Antichrist is going to say the inner circle failed and the outer circle failed, but I'm not going to fail. I'm going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth forever. 200 million soldiers are going to come. At the height of World War II, America had 12 million people in uniform. But this army is going to be 200 million. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to be coming back riding a white horse and he's going to, his vesture is going to be dipped in blood and he's going to speak and this army is going to be destroyed. The Bible says the blood is going to flow for 200 miles in a river of blood up to the bit of a bridle of a horse. Now, a bit of a bridle of a horse is about chest high for the average man. That's about four foot high. Can you imagine blood flowing for 200 miles? It's going to be the biggest battle in the world's history. It's going to be the most awesome, awesome battle in all of history. And uh, <clears throat> Zechariah 14 and verse 2 says, For I will gather all nations. If America is still around at that time, we're going to be an Antichrist's army against Israel. Right. If we're still around. For I will gather all nations, every nation on the earth is coming against Israel. Amen. Israel's going to be totally, absolutely, totally isolated. All nations. That doesn't happen in the first battle, that doesn't happen in the second battle, but in the third battle it does. That's how you know you're talking about Israel here. All nations are coming against Israel. About one-third of the nations in the world are going to be coming against Israel be involved in this battle, in the Magog battle. About one-third. But all of them are going to be involved in the second battle. Jesus is coming back soon, friend. I don't know when Jesus is coming. But He's coming back soon. The Bible says in Revelation 19 that he's going to come back wearing many crowns. Right. Amen. Riding a white horse, his vesture dipped in blood. And if, you might not ride a horse down here, but friend, if you're saved, you're going to ride a horse then. Amen. <laughs> we're all going to come riding horses. Right. Amen. But we're not going to do the fighting, amen? Amen. The Lord's going to do all the fighting. He will not come back as a suffering Savior. He'll come back as a conquering King. He'll not come back with a destiny to go to the cross. No. He'll come back as our judge. Amen. 
And so, if you're not saved, by all means, be saved tonight. Yes. Saved from what? Well, saved from hell. Amen. Saved to what? Saved to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. Amen. There's only one way to be saved. And that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for you. Yes. Amen. He died for me. But He demands our repentance and our faith and trust in Christ as a, for our salvation. And so tonight, by all means, you come forward. Not He doesn't He doesn't require church membership. He doesn't require baptism. He, he just require, requires you to come as you are, trusting Christ as your Savior. I'm going to draw what it might look like that day. The day, the day Jesus comes back. That valley in northern Israel called the plain of Jezreel, Megiddo, and Armageddon. Let's have uh, all the lights out, please.